On this week's prequel episode, we follow up on our Watchmen listener polls and preview The Parent Trap. Hello and welcome back to this film. This is the podcast where we talk about movies that are based on books. We have maybe the most feedback we've ever had. Um, so... <laughs> Yeah, um, our prequel episodes uh, usually tap out at around five pages. Yeah, this one's thirteen. Yep, and it's primarily <laughs> feedback because we uh, we we had a feeling that might happen, so we intentionally thought we probably weren't going to have a learning thing segment, uh, which we don't, but we still have thirteen pages of notes, which mm-hmm. is awesome. We we love getting the feedback. Keep it up in the future. It's our favorite. It's my favorite thing about the prequel episodes is hearing what everybody has to say. Um, so definitely uh, keep up the feedback. But yeah, we're going to get into it because we got we got a lot to cover. But before we get to the feedback, we got to do what we always do and shout out our patrons. I put up with you because your father and mother were our finest patrons. That's why. We have one new patron this week at the five dollar Hugo Award winning level, and they are Honda Quality Control Protects Civic Virtue. I don't, so we're the only podcast they support on Patreon, and I do not get the reference, so I, I am not I sure no idea. Uh, if it's, I don't know if this is a name from something else, or if it's a reference that I'm just not getting, or what it is. I mean, obviously, it's kind of like a play on words, like a Honda Civic Virtue. I just don't, like, because they have a Honda Civic, but I don't, yeah. I don't understand the reference, so. Well, you got me. Go ahead and uh, hit us up with in on Patreon. Let us know what that name means, because I don't get it. <laughs> but thank you for supporting us and enjoy that bonus content. And as always, uh, we have our Academy Award winning patrons, our $15 supporters, and they are Matilde, Steve from Arizona, Paul, Kat Ensminger, Jeff Niederhofer, Teresa Schwartz, Ian from Wine Country, Winchester's Forever, Kelly Napier, Gray Hightower, Eli Young's Gratch, Just Gratch, Shelby says, I want a cat that will bring me a drone, That Darn Skag, V Frank, and Alina Starkov. Thank you all so much. As always, you're the best, Katie. Time for an hour and a half of listener feedback on Watchmen. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Okay, um, so on Patreon, we had three votes for the book, one for the movie, two listeners who couldn't decide. Steve from Arizona said, Well, I have a feeling I will be the only one that goes against the grain on this one, thus angering Alan Moore and most likely battling claims of having lost my mind. I really liked this movie. It's not because I am a Snyder fanboy, but I just enjoyed it from a film-going experience. I have seen all three versions, and I feel I can interchangeably watch them depending on the mood I am in. While the political and philosophical subtexts were lost during much of the film, I never really felt like it was necessary. Even for Alan Moore noobs, they would have ultimately learned about the crabby, endlessly miserable visionaries' political and personal views, and would have ultimately interpreted it as a far left view of the world unless you're an idiot like tom pool it's tim pool i believe i don't know who that he is might, either it's, way it's, so it, it's tim pool and he is an idiot it would have been bold to include these ideals in the film but i didn't miss them what i did find mesmerizing was the attention to detail and the desire to bring this novel to life I didn't necessarily love the art style of the book, for I was spoiled with the likes of Dark Horse Comics, Garth Ennis, and other off-the-kilter comics like Hellblazer and Hellboy, where the art was much more polished. Not to say Watchmen was terrible, but let's face it, the 90s really upped the ante on artistry and detail. I'm sure some people will angrily disagree, but hey, this is one man's opinion. I will say, I thought famously the 90s were terrible for comics. I don't know. Maybe not the art. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know enough to don't even know. say, but I thought I thought very famously there was a lot of bad comics in the 90s, but maybe not. Or maybe there is, but there's also good. I don't know. I have no idea. As for the ending, I felt it made a lot more sense when it came to a unification trope. Even as far back as 20 years ago, the idea of life on other planets was being debated. Heck, I saw a person on Facebook recently claim Earth is the only planet with life on it. 
theories, hunches, and conspiracies would have torn the alien idea apart, especially since the 9-11 conspiracy was ramping up fervently in 2009. Making Dr. Manhattan the enemy is a much better idea, especially in the world of the comic where the guy basically won a war and is a living god. While my equally nerdy friends of mine disagree on the quality of the film as a whole, we begrudgingly agree this change had to be made. The alien looks ridiculous. Yeah, I said it. Watchmen is not a perfect movie, I can always admit that, but the cinematography, art design, and even the sound and music design make it a top-notch viewing experience. Jackie Earl Haley and Matthew Good stole the show for me, even if their performances lacked some of the nuance of their written counterparts. Very mixed feelings on this feedback overall. I disagree with some of it and agree with a lot of it in general. I think I think in general it is, you know, it's a very... Um, the cinematography and art design and the sound is well done. The music I could leave or take depending on, we discussed some of that in the episode, some of the needle drops I thought didn't age so well, maybe yeah. necessarily. Um, I also don't agree. I can think with the premise that the idea that as far back as 20 years ago, the idea of life on other plants was being debated and thus theories, hunches and conspiracies would have torn the alien idea apart. I, I, there was a giant alien body in the middle of Manhattan and the, like there's not, I, I don't think there would have been a, deb I don't know. I think it would have easily taken over. And also part of it is it blasts the world with a psychic wave that like doubly reinforces the fear of the alien. I don't think that would have been an issue. I think the, uh, the change works fine, but, and I also disagree. I think the alien looks fine. I think it looks pretty cool. It's like a weird squid monster thing. It looks cool. I think, you know, um, I think it falls in line with some like fun early alien monsters. I think it looks pretty gnarly. We only see it like once in a graphic novel anyways. Um, but uh, apart from that, I generally agree with a lot of that uh, ish. Maybe, maybe not. I also think that the political stuff was important, but <laughs> thanks for the feedback. Uh, nonetheless, Steve, appreciate it. All right. Since we have so much feedback, we're going to uh, swap back and forth on this or so Katie doesn't lose her voice <laughs> reading all the feedback. Next up from Bridget of Hestia. I love the movie and the book. Before the boys came out, this was the only notable look at what real superheroes would be like. Actual capital G gods, playboys who could afford to outfit themselves and always be perfectly trained, author authoritarians or outright fascists, sociopaths, and those who do it because it excites them. As I said elsewhere, this movie holds a special place in my heart for me. It came out literally on my birthday and my sister got tickets to a midnight showing for us. The only thing I needed to do was drive four hours and, uh, and afterwards sack out on the dining room floor for the night. Oh, to have the ability to sleep on a hardwood floor again and not wake up hating life. I don't know if I've ever been able to sleep on a hardwood floor. Not a hardwood floor. No. <laughs> I've slept. I've slept on my share of floors, but yes. they were usually carpeted. Yeah, I've slept on the ground outside before several times, but never a hard way. That was, oof. yeah. Um, it's a close call for me. I can't really fault a comic book movie that's based on something so central to comic history and which also has a distinct beginning and end for being as faithful and accurate as it was. Jeffrey Dean Morgan did an absolutely st uh, sterling job as the comedian to the level that I couldn't see him as anything else, even John Winchester and Supernatural for years afterwards. But much like my beloved Aubrey uh, Maturin novels, there's so much that a movie just can't go over without having a runtime measured in weeks. That, too, had a great movie... Oh, I assume this Aubrey. Mar okay. That too had a great movie with superb acting, but they both just can't compete with their sources, which are so rich in lore, backstory, and illusions that they become the gold standard for their respective media. I have to give this one to the Watchmen graphic novel for being almost unrivaled, but uh, oh, some Latin words. It's the who watches the watchers, but K, uh, custodiet ipsos custodies. I do, especially when it has a soundtrack that still slaps. I agree with most of that soundtrack debatable, depending on. <laughs> I do like most of the soundtrack, to be fair. There's just a handful of them that have not, in my opinion, have kind of, because of the cultural milieu, have kind of aged in a in a way that makes yeah. them feel a little cheesy I, yeah. viewing in 2023. But it's they worked perfectly fine in the in the moment. Our next comment was from Colin Osborne, who said, I really enjoyed this movie when it came out, but it hits a little different now. I still like the movie, but the book comes out way ahead. It holds up better, I think, and does a better job of exploring the theme of the inherently damaging effect of power on both the people who wield it and the people around them. I agree with that one almost entirely. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Very good. Next up from Matilde, we have, I'll start by saying that I'm really not the target audience for this one. Yeah, I can me count, either, Matilde. <laughs> I can count on one hand the number of comics I've read, and I'm indifferent to Zack Snyder movies. Still, I gave it a read and watched the ultimate cut to have the most complete experience. I appreciate the comics originality, the different take on superheroes, and the melting pot of articles, comic panels, tales, and book ex excerpts. When it comes to the movie, I thought it was overall competent and quite a faithful adaptation, which is hard to find and to make. Now on to my probular, probably unpopular opinions. The comic artwork art ugh. the comic artwork artwork fell flat and slow. The color palette was very unappealing, and the designs of the characters were very bled to me. Apart from Rorschach, in his case, they actually bothered to give him an interesting and engaging face under that mask. In the preview, you mentioned that the artist designed the characters in order to make them easy to draw. Well, it certainly shows. That's just my impression. I might be missing a lot considering my lack of experience with the medium. I thought the movie was self-absorbed and took itself way too seriously. <laughs> I would disagree in the sense that the movie takes itself just as seriously as the comic book does, which is pretty freaking seriously. <laughs> I would have killed for a single joke or a moment of levity to balance things. I think there were jokes, but... And the slow-mo was at a John Woo level. Have you ever seen a Zack Snyder film? <laughs> I was exhausted by the end. There's only so many times I can roll my eyes. I'm a character first person, and here I couldn't give an F about anyone. They were all either terrible or boring or both, and while it is intentional to a point, it made it impossible for me for to be engaged or appreciate the story. I kind of enjoyed Ozymandias and his posturing, but, uh, but that could have just been my Matthew Good bias. The boy is very charming, uh, no matter the movie. I get the point Watchmen is trying to make, but I hate the path the, it took to develop it. I was so annoyed by the end that I was almost willing to side with Ozymandias or Rorschach. Go ahead, destroy the world. There's nothing worth saving here. So yeah, I can't decide between the comic or the movie because I found both insufferable and pretentious. I would, however, read The Black Freighter on its own or watch a standalone movie about it ha that had potential. Oh, sorry. Or, or watch a standalone movie about it that had potential. Uh, I don't agree, obviously, with uh, I kind of agree with the movie critique, I think, overall, like your critique of the movie. I don't necessarily disagree with because I especially viewing it in 2023 as opposed to 2009. Mm. Um, I don't agree with I think the I think the comic has a lot of really interesting things to say, and I think it does it really well. And it, it worked for me. I also think that. You know, I, I was able to find the characters pretty engaging and interesting, despite the fact that I hated most of them. I actually I was talking to Shelby about this. She had commented or messaged or something. And I said, you know, you've created something really good when I hate every character in it and still think it's a masterpiece. Mm -hmm. Like I because I am also a very character driven person in stories. Um, and I found that I hated most of the characters and still thought it was like very good and enjoyed it a lot. So. Interesting. Different perspectives. Got some uh, opinions on the artwork so far. Yeah, that's what's interesting. So I, I will say I don't have a really good frame of reference for yeah. graph for graphic novels and comics in terms of like how good it I is mean, compared I, to other stuff. I didn't read it, obviously. Yeah. I flipped through the book a couple times and it looked to me like a pretty standard it, like from the era yeah. comic book style. I, I so won't I don't say know. It, I won't say it was particularly like like beautiful or like incredible or anything by any stretch. Mm -hmm. I did. I, I liked the color palette. I thought it worked for the story. Um, I think the thing to me that was most striking and what made the artwork most work, the art work most for me was it's just how evocative it was in, in, in like, and I talked about this quite a bit in the episode, but in, in how it made me like feel the story, mm -hmm. like, I, like there was moments and again, graphic novels, obviously that's what they're striving to do. Um, but, uh, and, and maybe the thing is if I read a bunch more graphic novels, I'm like, oh, I feel this way in every one. I don't know. Yeah. I've only read a, a, a dozen or so in my lifetime to be fair. Um, but I don't remember ever having that experience of being like, wow, this is so evocative and so like visceral feeling something about it. But, uh, but that being said, it wasn't like, I will say there wasn't a lot of stuff where I was like, wow, this is like stunningly gorgeous, mm -hmm. and, you know, illustrations or anything. I just thought there was. And I think part of it is that it really does feel like like storyboards from a movie to where I could just it it very easily made my the way my brain works. I was very easily able to translate the images into a movie in my head. Mm -hmm. Like I was so easy. It was so easy for me to see what the motion and this and what I was supposed to be seeing like emotion wise and what characters supposed to be doing and what. And that I think was the thing 
that and like transitions were really cool like all that stuff was what really stuck out to me more so than like wow this is really p- pretty i would want to print this single frame and put it on my wall is not necessarily like the thing so much as like the physicality of it and how it moved and and transitioned and and stuff like that and how it translated to into my brains my mind's eye i guess <laughs> Um, I think this is, yes, our last comment on Patreon was from Ben Wilcox, our patron who requested Watchmen. Mm -hmm. Um, And Ben said, thanks so much for doing this one. You are welcome, Ben. Um, Watchmen was arguably one of the first really big, really influential deconstructions of the superhero genre. I don't know that it's the best superhero deconstruction. I found Worm, a cult hit web novel, to be more impactful hmm. and more modern reconstructions of the superhero genre, genre <laughs> like Invincible, which got a cartoon adaptation on Amazon, heard is good. more fun than Watchmen. But it's a foundational work for the modern era of comics. It's a bit too focused on the Cold War to be as relevant today as it was when it came out, but a lot of it still holds up amazingly well. Yeah, I'd agree with that. The movie, on the other hand, well, Zack Snyder claims to be a Democrat, and he says a lot of the right things about feminism and progressive values and whatnot, but despite what he says, he somehow keeps recreating a lot of fascist and misogynistic images and themes in his movies. Because he's a liberal and he doesn't think about it that deeply. (laughs) He's just like a surface level liberal, like he is, I think it's true. I think that's what it is, and it's like I talked about in the prequel, he just doesn't think too deeply about what the stories he's telling say, or you know what he's portraying says like no thoughts all slow-mo yeah and it's not no thoughts it's just very surface level thoughts i think to some extent because yeah i just don't think he yeah like i said i I think that's the (laughs) biggest thing is that he doesn't really like look at the whole thing and go okay so what is this saying this feels like maybe i just made a yeah fascist propaganda i don't think he realizes that and I think part of that is because he's like a very generic milk toast, like liberal centristy kind of like mm. guy. Yeah. Who's just not that interested in politics, if I had to guess. Like it's he's interested in things that are cool. <laughs> he's like most people. <laughs> he's a normie, all right? <laughs> Spoilers. Most people are normies. Some of them make billion dollar movies. <laughs> Uh, So Ben went on to say, the fascist themes were already there in the original 300, and arguably Batman was teetering on the edge, depending on who's writing him. Frank Miller. (coughs) But... (laughs) I don't know, I'm just saying things to piss people off, sorry. (laughs) But he also somehow managed to make Superman borderline fascist, and not in the fun, interesting way Invincible did. So I think it might be a him problem. Maggie Mae Fish has a good series of videos breaking down his movies on YouTube, which I highly recommend. She's great. I've not seen her Zack Snyder movies or episodes, but her content's great. Um, I think Shelby uh, mentioned Maggie Mae Fish as well. I've I've watched a lot of her videos over the years. I hadn't seen the movie when it first came out, but I went and watched it for this episode, and wow, he really gives Rorschach way too sympathetic of a framing. The dramatic death scene with Night Owl in the background doing the big no contrasts pretty sharply with his almost perfunctory death in the original comic. No witnesses, no long zoom out of a symbolic Rorschach's blot, just a wisp of bloody steam. The movie was technically competent, well cast, and well acted, and surprisingly faithful to the visuals of the comic, but it fundamentally misses the point that the comic was making. I missed the end of the poll, but I would have voted for the book, no question. Did you add his to the... I don't think I did. Okay, well then we have one more. That's fine. We'll we'll put one more on the final tally at the end. I I think I agree that he, I think it's interesting because I agree that I think Zack Snyder fundamentally misses the point that the graphic novel was making, but it's like what I said in the prequel. He presents it generally, he presents it so, other than like small changes, the Rorschach death, some other things, he presents it so faithfully to what transpires in the graphic novel that you can kind of get the same thing out of it Mm -hmm. that you get out of the graphic novel even if Zack Snyder doesn't realize (laughs) that's what you're getting out of it it's the like I said the cat with the drone thing um I think I don't know I I don't think it's again very clearly for the reasons I expanded on the episode it's not as obvious in the in the movie and I think it would be it's far easier to watch the movie and just kind of see it as a surface level like like comic book movie that that really isn't saying anything way deeper um but it is there 
and it, and again, whether or not he recognizes it, he puts all the the elements on the screen, mm. and it's kind of up to you what you get out of it. He does. He is more sympathetic to some of the the more problematic stuff than I think you would prefer. Like I would prefer if I was picking somebody <laughs> to make this movie, but. Like I said in the prequel, I think there's something interesting about somebody who doesn't really get it and just puts it on screen as is. Um, there's some merit to that, to some degree. <laughs> like I said, I think it's it, and maybe I maybe I'm I'm slightly biased by the fact that I read the graphic novel before watching it this time, so I kind of was primed for what I was supposed to be getting out of the movie. Yeah. And and I'm sure that helps, but I still think it's mostly there because the vast majority of the most important stuff is translated so directly that I just feel like <laughs> you can get it. It's just not as it's maybe a little bit couched in Zack Snyder's obsession with things that look cool and glossing over like the more important political stuff. Yeah. Anyways. All right. Go over on Facebook. We had six bo- votes for the book and two for the movie. First up, we have Michael who says, I love both, but the weaknesses lie in the endings. Giant man-made space squid or Dr. Manhattan bombs. Not sure either ending works, really. I don't, I think they work, but without any extra. (laughs) I mean, what the movie did work, I thought worked fine. Not not having read the graphic novel and having no idea there even was a giant space squid. I I thought the movie worked fine. Yeah. But. I I would say the same thing. I thought that, I thought it worked okay, but I don't, I don't know. I, I. Without again, without hearing what you thought would have worked better, I'm not sure if I can <laughs> expound much on that. I, it worked for me. So <laughs> we have Jeremy Magi who says Magi. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. I agree with the fantasy world read of the Mars Clubhouse, but I think on a deeper level, it also hits on the theme of his diminishing humanity. He has less and less subjective involve, investment in the species he used to belong to. So while there is an emotional comp, uh, component of denial and deflection in his Mars tantrum, he is also legitimately just not feeling like we're all that important when he can see and control all of space time and is beyond human. But there are still traces of John in there and Lori mattered to John. So she is able not only to shatter his defensive mechanism, but to genuinely persuade him to care in a cheerful nihilist way. Just because these people don't matter in an equation doesn't mean that there's not a reason to love and protect them yeah for sure agree with that uh definitely something that's more obvious in the in the book than it comes across in the film for sure our next comment was from warren who said i chose the movie i've never read the comic i tried a couple times but can't get past the artwork it's a style that doesn't gel with me i think it's similar to when people say they can't watch old movies because they look dated if that makes sense Mm -hmm. The first time I saw this, I didn't really know anything about Watchmen other than that it was considered the greatest comic of all time. In fact, the only reason I saw the movie was that it was written by David Hayter, the voice of Solid Snake from Metal Gear Solid, and more importantly, a writer on X-Men 2, which is my all-time favorite superhero movie. I didn't know... He wrote... If I'm, I'm thinking back to the wikipedia article yeah he did like an earlier version Uh, which then got reworked and like you remember on the prequel how we talked about how it went through like multiple studios um so he might have a writing credit on that for that like early version yeah he does have a writing credit on imdb for it it just says writer it says i'm pretty sure that's what it is is that he wrote because he wrote a, he wrote a script that was like a couple studios before it eventually ended yeah. up getting made. There are two writers credited, David Hayter and Alex C. Say yeah. or whatever. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I Yeah, and that's interesting. I didn't know that he wrote X-Men 2 or that he was the voice of uh, Snake on in Metal Gear. I Actually, did, I did know I that did, about Snake. But... I did talk about him writing the X-Men yes, films in the prequel. Yes. Uh, Warren went on to say, I feel I got a similar experience from this film that readers of the graphic novel say they got reading that for the first time. It felt like someone doing something different with superheroes. The lines between good and bad are way more blurred, and that moment when Veidt's plan is revealed to have already happened, my jaw hit the floor. I looked around the cinema to see if I was dreaming. This was the first superhero movie I saw, and may still be the only one, that the heroes lose with no hope of stopping the villain's plan. 
I left the theater not sure how to feel, like it wasn't the movie I'd expected. It was slow-paced, more talking than fighting. I wasn't sure if it was saying something or not. <laughs> Zack Snyder film, baby! <laughs> <laughs> I kept thinking at the time, that's not how superhero movies work. But dang, it looked great. And so many moments stuck with me, especially that ending. I bought the home release, and I'm glad I did. Snyder's films always feel better on rewatches, especially if you treat them like art house films where everything can and does have meaning, and you go looking for that's it. That's so fascinating, because I assure you it's not there. <laughs> At least uh, that's not maybe not entirely true. but <laughs> In any of them, there's always little details you didn't notice the first time that reward you going back through, little lines that mean more with the added context. Even the subtext and themes become clearer with each view Viewing. Like, I feel a lot of the themes and messages that people say are in the book, but not in the movie, seem to me to be there. It felt very obvious this time watching it, which might also be helped with me being older, more media literate now versus then. I will agree again, to some extent, this is reiterating what I just said in the last comment. I think they are there. I think it's just not as obvious, but I think it's there because, again, it's so directly translated that it's there. Yeah. It's just less, less so. <laughs> I get the same thing from his films as I do Paul Verhoeven. Yeah. Paul Verhoeven's and David Ooh, Lynch's movies. You just made a lot of people mad by comparing <laughs> Zack Snyder to Paul Verhoeven and David Lynch. <laughs> It's a shame you didn't watch the director's cut. It paces better, and a couple of things you said you missed yes. in the theatrical are in that version. Rorschach uses the grapple gun oh. in the police fight and Hollis Manson's death, which is beautifully tragic. Yeah, I mentioned that in the episode that it was in the director's cut. The ultimate cut is a different story. The black freighter pieces really tank the piecing when, pacing when added to the movie. Love the movie, love the show, and surprised your first graphic novel wasn't Snowpiercer. One day... I, we we would like to do Snowpiercer. It's one of the my favorite problem movies. the problem with Snowpiercer is that it was it's it's originally French. Yeah. And an English translation is expensive. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. Huh. Oh, I would I love to do it. I think it might be out of print. Well, though maybe not now. I haven't checked like recently, but Yeah, I'd have to go look. Cuz with, the TV, they, with show, the TV show, yeah, it might, they might, might have, have done a reprint. Reprinted. Um, but well, it's also like 600 pages. I'll read it. I don't care. Okay, I that can be a huge yeah, thing. Yeah, like I said, it's one of my favorite movies. Um, I love it a lot. So I would be, I'd be happy to do it one day. Uh, I yeah, I've heard the same thing about the ultimate cut that, and I will say, and some people said this, and I I don't necessarily disagree. As interesting as I thought the Black Freighter stuff was in the graphic novel, I think it also kind of tanks the pacing of the graphic novel mm -hmm. a little bit. There are definite, there were definitely moments where I'm reading the Black Freighter stuff, and I'm like, all right, let's. I just want to get back to the actual story. Like, I get it. You're doing like a thematic thing here. But like, can I get back to the story? I enjoyed it, but I can see, especially because I was reading on a deadline where uh -huh. I'm like, you know, I got to get this done by X day so we can watch the movie, blah, blah, blah. And where I'm like, let's go, let's go, let's go. Um, So I, I get that uh, for sure. Because, yeah, I think even the, the graphic novel suffers a little pacing wise from the Black Freighter stuff as much as I in, enjoyed it. And then also on Facebook, we have Stephen Roberts, who says, the book was great, but I think the movie captured the essence of the books and works better. The visuals were superb. Not to mention, Dr. Manhattan made a better unifying event than the weird alien subplot. So, yeah, kind of mixed feelings on the, the Dr. Manhattan versus the giant alien, <laughs> which is interesting. Next up, we've got Andy. I voted for the book. There are two reasons Snyder had no chance from the start. Firstly, the book is a masterpiece of the form, and so all the elements that make it great are tied to the form itself. Secondly, Moore's work is based on the on a conscious leftist critique of the dormant powers of the time, the Cold War, the economics, and the superhero genre that can so easily cheerlead its worst impulses. The thing Moore loathes, Snyder often outright warships in his films. 100% agree with that. I watched 300 as an adult during the War on Terror. My jaw dropped at how fascist and servile to power it was, along with whitewashing the Spartans and literally demonizing the Persians. Simply put, Snyder doesn't actually understand Watchmen on a thematic level, along with all the people who think Rorschach is supposed to be awesome. Saying that, I quite enjoyed the film, although the better parts lack the meaning laid out uh, in the book for but reasons above, as Snyder tries to copy the look and letter of the lines, he hits upon some of the best editing and montage work. The opening credit sequence fashioned from the Minutemen history is great, the sequence going back over the comedian's life is good too, and as you guys and other commenters mentioned, mentioned many of the changes made to fit the film, including the ending event, work really well. The fact of the matter is, though, 
The fact of the matter is, though, be it the Cold War, the post-9-11 conflicts with the Mideast, or whatever is shaping up next, Moore and Snyder are starkly different artists and thinkers, so the film was never going to be more than a curiosity. Fun fact, Watchmen started out as a project Moore wrote when DC bought out Charlton Comics, but later went back on which characters uh, to give him, so he had to change names and rework a bit, but yeah, the comedian is his take on Peacemaker. Yeah, we did mention specifically that in the prequel episode, that it was Charlton Comics characters that they were going to give him, and then said, no, you got to make your own characters. Um, but I agree very uh, pretty much entirely with this comment. It mirrors a lot of what I had to say. Um, about the film and, and just Snyder and Moore being very different people mm -hmm. um, and with very different understandings of the world. And Moore is definitely a more, um, is a deeper thinker than Snyder is uh, for all the good and bad that entails. I would much rather have a beer with Zack Snyder than Alan Moore. I would not, I don't want to talk to Alan Moore. He's a fascinating guy, I'm sure, with lots of interesting things to say, clearly. Um, but man, he, I bet he's just kind of insufferable. Um, whereas Zack Snyder, I bet's like a pretty nice guy and would be fun to hang out with. <laughs> Despite Probably. the fact that he doesn't realize he's making fascist propaganda half the time. Uh, but yeah, in this case, I will say, and now I don't know, because because 300, I believe, is a Frank Miller. Um, I think you're right. Which that is very different because Frank Miller kind of is a fascist from what I know of Frank mm -hmm. Miller, especially in his older age. Um, or at least he's he's a way more conservative, -y, right leaning kind of um, fascist sympathetic uh, overall, um, whereas Alan Moore is obviously the opposite of that. Um, so I do think I think it's it's just a matter of Zack Snyder. Again, I've said it a lot. He likes things that he thinks are cool. And so he just makes movies that he thinks are cool. And when he makes one based on Frank Miller's work, it becomes <laughs> a fascist uh, propaganda piece. And when he makes one based on Alan Moore's work, it, it it is it is there, but it's not. I will say it's not as like lefty as Watchmen, the graphic novel is, but it is there. And so I think he he's just a, he's an empty vessel that. Just, <laughs> That's not fair. I'm sorry. That's not fair. That's what I said. No thoughts. Yeah. All slow mo. That's not fair. Um, he's not. But but it is very much he because he likes putting the work the page on the screen so directly. It it, it whatever the book has to say at least to some extent gets put on the screen. And so right. in Watchmen's case, you get a uh, you know a vaguely left leaning um, critique of superheroes that glorifies them in a way that feel, that is a little bit antithetical to the point, but still is there. And then with 300, yeah, you get this nightmare, um, literally like fascist propaganda. It's, you know, it is what it is. It's interesting. It's, 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 it, again, I've said it a lot, but he's a very fascinating filmmaker because of that. Our next comment was from Jeremy who said, I love both. If pressed, I would have to give it to the book. Though I do think the movie's change to the ending does a better job of being quasi-plausible and staying more consistent with the overarching nuclear themes. Dr. Manhattan, with his hydrogen symbol and his potential for both great good and great harm, just hovering menacingly out there as some vague, unrealized threat, there's poetry there. I agree with that. I, again, I think it, it does, that's why it works as good yeah. as it does, yeah. Uh, love the vagina squid alien for its weirdness. And the callbacks to it in the HBO show. Yeah, apparently, yeah. Yeah, but even in this alternate reality, it feels too convoluted and unlikely to be as effective. Also, that psychic shock element is just kind of weird, especially since Manhattan is arguably the only one with supernatural powers. I also I always read Ozymandias as willing himself into ubermensch territory, essentially a genius with superior martial arts training and discipline. The bullet thing is impressive, but one step removed from a parlor trick. And even then, he bleeds in the comics, if I remember right. He does in the movie, too, slightly, yeah. But despite that, the book is just so nuanced and layered and compelling. I read that Snyder literally used the book as a kind of storyboard or script, which is why it's so visually faithful in so many ways. But the gleeful hyperviolence action sometimes feels like it undercuts the tones and themes of the source material, in my opinion. Also, that Hallelujah sex scene is a choice. Still, the movie is way better than any adaptation of this work had any right to be. Really enjoyed it overall, even though my heart still chooses the book. 
Yeah, I agree with that a lot. Like I said, it, it's, it's better than it has any right to be considering the source material and especially considering Zack Snyder doing it. But um, <laughs> it, uh, I, I, I also agree yeah, to some extent. Yeah, I, I guess the, the, the violence thing, it does still, and it's kind of talked about in general, just kind of glorifies still the superheroes in a way that is somewhat antithetical to the point. Right. Or it's not somewhat. But it's entirely antithetical to the said, point of a graphic novel. He likes to make things that look yeah. cool. He likes to make things that look cool. Yeah. And yeah, so I and it is I really think a big part of it is uh because we're seeing so many wide, you know, opinions on this. I think a lot of it is which is interesting in its own right, how you go into the movie, like what you go into the movie expecting mm-hmm. and thinking it's going to be and how you watch it. Like if you I think if you watch it more critically and more um like with e- even a little bit of awareness of what the graphic novels generally about that it is about like that it is like a critique of superheroes and power and all this sort of stuff i think if you have even the slightest inkling of that bouncing around in your head when you're watching the movie it works mm-hmm. if you don't then i think the movie could teeter the other direction where you don't realize yeah. What the movie's doing, maybe. And yeah. it just comes across as this hyper violent, kind of boring comic book movie. Cause was what that was my original kind of takeaway when I watched it in 2009 when it came out when I was in college. It was like, all right, that was kind of boring and whatever. I had not been exposed to, I had no idea what it was about. I'd not, I, at the time, I'd not even remotely exposed to any like leftist thought or anything like that or, or, or anything like that. I was a very yeah. just generic, milk toast liberal in my, <laughs> my college days. <laughs> Uh, you know, with very little kind of critical understanding of this type of media. And so, yeah, I just was like, yeah, it was kind of a boring comic book movie. But like the part where, he, you know, they beat up all those guys in the jail was cool, I guess, whatever. <laughs> like, you know, that right. just I, I, I watched it. I think how Zack Snyder w- like made it <laughs> kind of. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, next up, we have Ian or sorry, last one from Facebook. We have Ian. I came across Watchmen because a former student of mine was reading it for her psych class. She needed help, so I hunted down a copy of the novel and watched the movie from a Japanese streaming website. I do enjoy Alan Moore's comics, even if he is a bit much by all accounts. I find the comedian a fascinating character. At first glance, he just seems like a dumb, cynical brawler who uses his fist to solve problems. But taking a deeper look, he's actually a smart fellow uh, since he's the first to figure out Veidt's plan. Although I will say he does figure it out in the graphic novel from my memory kind of just stumbles across it like he's flying back from central america or mm-hmm. he's he's in south america doing some <laughs> some marxist republic toppling or whatever or uh, some marxist state toppling or whatever and just like happens to see the island where they're building the oh. i thought is i could be wrong about that I, there's a little detail that i didn't talk about in the episode so i don't remember i thought he just kind of stumbled across it and then sort of he does piece it together first obviously but I, I thought it was kind of just dumb luck that he'd like, oh, what's going on here? And then kind of figures it out. Um, but anyways, I could be wrong. Maybe he does more detective work than I'm remembering. Um, everyone else, even with Manhattan, is about two steps behind. He's also the first to bring up the hu- hypocrisy of Manhattan about killing the Vietnamese girl that's threatening the comedian. Uh, yeah, uh, he could have done pretty much anything else, and yet he explodes her. Wait, what? He does not explode her. <laughs> What are you talking about? Uh, and that's, I don't know what you're, what, in that scene, the comedian shoots her. Yeah. <laughs> and kills her. That's what I remember. And Manhattan, he is being hypocritical because he could have stopped yes. the comedian from killing her, but, but Manhattan does not <laughs> explode her or whatever. He just doesn't stop the comedian from killing her. A- unless I'm misreading what you're trying to say here or you're talking about a different something or whatever. Yeah, he just... Unless he means after she dies, but I don't think that's the like he explodes her body or something. I don't I don't, I don't know. Uh, the comedian shoots and kills her, and and then he just chastises Manhattan for giving him shit because it's like, well, why didn't you like vaporize the bullet or whatever? Which is really Manhattan's first disconnect from humanity that we see. Without a second thought, he explodes a pregnant woman to save his this jaded asshole. Okay, I don't know what <laughs> that is not what transpires. I'm sorry. I'm trying. <laughs> 
That is not what transpires. Um, <laughs> he just doesn't save her, which I again kind of illustrates what you're talking about his yeah. disconnect from humanity or yeah. whatever. I think that's also there. I just, you've created a scene in your head of what transpired. I would have to go double check, but I, uh, it is uh, like 99%. I have to look now. Am I like having a stroke? <laughs> yeah, okay. I just went back to the book and watched it again. It's, he does not explode. <laughs> It's exactly as it happens in the movie. Uh, he the comedian shoots her, and then comedian leaves, and then Doctor Manhattan just kind of stares at her body, and then the scene ends. There's no. <laughs> Your version is very interesting. I don't know where that came from, but <laughs> anyways, uh, with us without a second thought, he explodes a pregnant woman to save this jaded asshole. I looked up what Silk Spectre Two is smoking with a parent in the tobacco industry. I've been on the peripheral edge of cigarettes most of my life. From what I gathered, she's either smoking an original product that Alan created just for the comic. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. A crack pipe, which I'm less inclined to believe with her character. It's not. It's tobacco. Or a pipe of peace, which was an early 1900s version of Inhaler, uh, amusingly enough, created by the chap who invented the machine gun. Very Ooh. interesting. Uh, it's a very close call, but I went for the movie. Uh, okay, then getting wrapping up and getting to the end here. It's a very close book call, but I went for the movie fight using Manhattan's energy signature to blow up cities works better than the alien squid plan. The movie is very much a comic book come to life. There you go. All right. Sorry. I got, I just got so sidetracked thinking I was having a stroke <laughs> and miss completely misremembering what <laughs> happened in that scene. <laughs> oh, thank you all very much over on Facebook. Katie, let's head to Twitter. All right. On Twitter, we had 29 votes for the book two for the movie. And one listener who couldn't decide, Amanda Price, said the movie was mediocre at best. Some good intentions disguised as dark and brooding, deep takes. I didn't hate it, but for as much ire as it got because it strayed oddly from the book's substance, it just felt lacking. Hmm. And I think if you're if you're just kind of watching a movie without any. Yeah. Again, I think if you don't have the frame of reference of what the comic's trying to say. The movie maybe isn't as effective. I think it's still there, but yeah, I, I, get, I get that perspective for sure. Next up, we have Huey Gibson who asks, or not, <laughs> I don't know why we're doing a call-in uh, radio <laughs> show now. Next up, we have Huey Gibson who says, long time listener, but for the first time, I felt the need to vote. Well, vote more often, Huey. <laughs> This one was so hard for me to decide. I really love them both, and for me, it is Snyder's least awful movie, but the ridiculousness of the ending of the book did it for me. Moore notoriously hates all his adaptations, but this one was pretty close to the source material. I don't know why he disliked it so much. I don't know which way I, you he voted. He just seems kind of contrary. Yeah, he's yeah, he's very much seems like yeah. a very contrarian kind of guy. He turned he took his Hugo and turned it into a birdbath, because you know. Like you do. Yeah. Also on Twitter, we have April Itmansky uh, from No Such Thing as a Bad Movie Pod. Thank you, April, who says, I've wanted to read and watch this one for years, so thanks for covering. I am pro-giant squid, probably because that's what they did in the HBO show. I just feel like it's much more believable that would stop the war versus Dr. Manhattan, who everyone already knew about anyway. Also, I thought Matthew Good as Ozymandias sucked. <laughs> Didn't have the physique and also used a German accent at the end randomly. I missed the German accent. I did not notice that. Jeremy Irons plays older Ozzy in the show. Perfect casting. Also, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross did the show's soundtrack much better than Snyder's constant needle drops. Uh, yeah, that sounds interesting. I do love Trent Reznor's scores usually. Um, and I could see Jeremy Irons as a great Ozymandias. I think he's that sounds perfect. I'm definitely we're definitely looking forward to watching the show now that we finally <laughs> have seen the movie and I've read the book. So awesome. Uh, and yeah, April also recommended the show, said it was great. So thank you very much. OK, our next comment is from Shelby's in her capybara era. Uh, everyone stay with me. Strap in. <laughs> Shelby wrote us a novel. <laughs> A thesis is what Shelby wrote. This is an entire thesis. Yeah. All right. Shelby I'm going to comment throughout because it is so long. I will not be able to go back and <laughs> okay. touch on things. Fine. I, I, um, but you're going to have to help me remember where yeah, I left off. Yeah. So Shelby said, I've mentioned that I went into this book and movie having seen some very interesting discussions about the changes that were made. This ended up being from two different videos, and I will try to distill my thoughts here. 
The first was overly sarcastic production's trope talk about realism. It's a short video about how modern realism, at least in genre fiction, has become shorthand for the dour, everything is terrible, grim dark, where life is pointless and we just live in it anyway. You could certainly get that surface level reading in the book from our main characters, but the book's subverting that with a very important element. I went into this movie watching to see if Zack Snyder still worked it into his movie. He not only doesn't include it, he carefully cuts one of the most important scenes down hmm. so as not to hint at that subversion in his movie. I was disappointed, but not surprised when this happened because I'd seen the second video. The video essay channel Maggie Mae Fish did a deep dive on Zack Snyder and the tropes and messaging in his movies, and I highly recommend it, specifically the video We're Already Dead. When you put all his movies next to each other and look for the common threads, it becomes clear that, quote, Snyder writes heroes who can only achieve their goals as a direct result of terrible acts of violence, whether that violence was done by a hero or someone else. Often specifically terrorist violence. It's a bizarre, unhealthy combination of might makes right and the end justifies the means. Somebody had to die. Somebody had to suffer. There's no way to help everyone. In this universe, community becomes meaningless because someone has to suffer in every interaction. You can't view your friends and neighbors as allies. You have to view them as sacrificial lambs for your own well-being. In Snyder's filmatic universe, it's less about whether or not someone dies, but how they die that matters. Mm -hmm. And this is because in Snyder's films, everyone is already dead. The idea that there's no use helping people because they're already dead is a constant truth in the Snyderverse. Hmm. End quote from, from that the, video. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, I, 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 from my recollection of mm -hmm. the Snyder movies I've seen, I think that that tracks. The nihilism is strong in both versions of Watchmen. Everything is awful and humanity isn't worth saving. While nobody besides Rorschach seems to like Comedian, the reason the Watchmen respect him and keep him around is because they believe he tells it like it really is in giant air quotes. We're told this by John, Veidt, and maybe even Sally in the book. The everyday people must be amoral. They're critical and unappreciative of what our heroes do. Some of them even say Comedian is a monster and John is dangerous. Where's that good in humanity that makes people worth saving? It must be gone. OSP's video already summed it up so well, quote, A good chunk of the book is devoted to showing us the failure of humanity, the dregs of the population. It looks like the pinnacle of modern grimdark, an onslaught of misery and realistic examinations of the dark face of humanity. But the book is subverting this, because in the middle of all the broad strokes definitions of humanity is corrupted is corrupt and cruel in between all these living gods making decisions about humanity as a whole for the greater good the book shows us little moments of good amid all the bad it's a little thing but a very deliberate inclusion alan moore for all his love of gritty realism very deliberately shows us some kindness in ordinary humanity kindness that ozymandias and dr manhattan can't see can't take into account because they don't exist on that level the comic Tales of the Black Freighter is read by a kid named Bernie who keeps coming to a newsstand owned by an old guy also named Bernie, and their interactions are small, everyday things, but they're kind. Old Bernie gives young Bernie his hat when it's raining, gives him the comic for free, just strikes up friendly conversation with the kid. And when Ozymandias puts his plan into action and kills half of New York with a telepathic space squid, both Bernies end up dead, but old Bernie is shielding young Bernie with his body in an attempt to save him. I will say, I that's not exactly the reading I got of the Bernie-Bernie relationship. I think it's there, and it's especially towards the end, that definitely veers that way. Mm -hmm. I would have to read it again, but... Most of the book, old Bernie, the, the newspaper stand guy, just kind of like rants hypocritically about politics and young Bernie just ignores him and reads his graphic novel <laughs> was my record. I could, again, that's my recollection of their relationship through like 75 percent of the of the novel um, is that he he he. he it's interesting. I'd have to go back. There's definitely hints of it here and there. Um, and definitely at the end, they do embrace like they do kind of like embrace as like the nuke is going off or whatever. 
Um, and they do have like a friendly interaction at the very end and realize they have the same name and like mm -hmm. kind of bond briefly before they get vaporized by the bomb, uh, by the squid bomb. But prior to that, I'm not. It's interesting. It's interesting. Anyways, continue. Sorry. Uh, they're pretty much strangers, but Alan Moore, King of the Grimdark, very deliberately shows us that basic human kindness is alive and well, and more importantly, that these godlike superheroes are failing to see it. End quote. This, for me, is the real big change between book and movie. What Alan Moore is trying to say versus what Zack Snyder is trying to say. And nowhere is it more clear than when we're faced with Veidt's weapon. Maybe this is different in the extended versions, but I doubt it. The death of half of New York is very clearly a reference to Hiroshima in the book. The Pulse artwork looks like a nuclear bomb. There's constant talk of nuclear war and John as a deterrent. It's practically text once a spray-painted silhouette of a couple yeah. shows up and a character says it reminds them of the shadows in Hiroshima. It stays ominously in the background for the rest of the book. Child Rorschach even tells us that Hiroshima was a good thing, actually, because it saved a lot of people. I guess he changed his mind in the end. The book pulls no punches. Byte's plan is another instance of one big horrific sacrifice to create peace. The final chapter opens with multiple pages of the streets covered in blood and bodies everywhere. These are the people Veidt sacrificed for his peace, and the book is horrified by his actions. Yeah. All these everyday people trying their best, people we've gotten to know, and Veidt killed them because he wanted to win. Compare that to the movie. Our characters teleport in and we get a distant shot of a crater. The rest is all close-ups of John and Laurie telling us how terrible it is with a bit of rubble behind them. It's the book's bloodiest scene, but this very bloody movie shies away from showing any. Why? Because these faceless people we never knew don't matter. They're just the people who had to die for the greater good. We see this difference earlier in the scene where John decides to save the day. He gives his beautiful speech about how incredible Laurie's existence is, but the movie's sure to cut the exchange at the end where Laurie says, you could say that about anyone, and he answers, exactly. In Snyder's movies, humanity is already dead and not worth saving, so John isn't allowed to see that that applies to everyone. I did not notice that, that they cut that part from the movie. I, I must have been in the middle of taking notes and just didn't realize yeah. that specific line was cut because that is a big, weird, bad change. <laughs> Anyways. It's his ex-girlfriend's existence that makes life worth fighting for. Just like how Snyder's Superman isn't motivated because humanity is worth saving, but because he has a girlfriend. The movie tactily does not care about the loss of life. In comparison, the book cares a great deal. It's Rorschach's death the movie cares about and the one it focuses on. That's what moves Dan to attack Veidt, not the millions Veidt tells us he grieves. Overall, I find the book's version much more compelling. I liked the movie fine, but I don't think it captures what's essential about the book. Um, and Shelby had some other really good comments and also shared the videos that she watched. Had to draw a line here because this was like over two pages of notes yeah. um, from Shelby. Thank you, Shelby. Yes, appreciate it. <laughs> uh, so go on Twitter um, on our poll post and check out her other feedback. Um, and like I said, she shared all her all, all her sources from her thesis. Yes. The thing that really stuck out to me in this and that I agree entirely with in a way like so viscerally that I, I am disappointed that I didn't it wasn't so striking to me in the moment is the note is the, is the point about the lack of bodies and the, the depiction of the devastation in New York when John and Lori arrive. Yeah. And I think the way Shelby boiled that down is hits it exactly on the head, I think. Um, and, and really belies th where the movie falls short in its morality and what it's trying to kind of get across. Um, comparing the fact that the movie really cares about Rorschach's death and doesn't really care that much about the millions of people who just got nuked in uh, New York city, because she's right in a movie where there's so much blood and violence and gore in that final scene in the book, when you get back to New York city, there's bodies everywhere, just yeah. body parts, blood everywhere. Um, because those are the, the, the people that's the devastation that matters in the book. Uh, is these normal everyday people who um, are, you know, killed for the quote unquote, the greater good. And the the movie just doesn't 
think that's important. Well, I think the movie doesn't think it's cool. That's the thing. The movie doesn't yeah. think that's cool. The movie thinks that's a downer. Yeah. Like, I mean, it is. And it is, but that's the point. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I think that is spot on um, and, uh, and, a, and a key point that I think was missing from my analysis that or that I wish I would have brought up. I, th- I think it was. Yeah, I, I think that is. Yeah, I think it's spot on. And I, I agree entirely. Uh, and I think that's maybe the biggest fatal flaw in what the movie does overall and where it falls the shortest. Um, and it also ties into because I, what I did mention a little bit in the episode is how I thought the Mar whole Mar scene worked a lot better uh, between Laurie and John in the book. And I, and a key component of it, I think whether I realized or not at the time was, and and I didn't at least explicitly realize that they cut, like I said, that line mm-hmm. where she says, well, that could apply to anybody. And he says, exactly. Um, because that is also pivotal um, where John sees the value in humanity, not just in Lori. Yeah. And kind of by extension humanity. Um, he like legitimately sees it in, in humanity. And I think very good point, very good stuff. And yeah, that 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 part that the point about the bodies, like I said, is it's that's uh, yeah, very, very, very good stuff. All right, heading over to Instagram. We had ten votes for the book and eight for the movie. First up from Joey Snowy Noe. Even though I'm a massive DC fan, I still haven't read this graphic novel. It's been sitting in my bookshelf for a while, and I haven't got into it yet. First things first is that I usually don't like Zack Snyder's films. I can't stand the Tony sets, and while his comic movies are cool visually, they don't match the tone of the characters. Superman being a character I love, his version just doesn't match the tone of the character at all. That being said, for Watchmen, his tone works. While I still think, uh, while I still would like to see a version of the story under a different person, I think this version is good for what it is. Kind of agree. I mean, yeah, generally, I think yeah. that, that I, I think like and a lot of people have said, you know, as as Zack Snyder movies go, this one works the best because it kind of tonally fits and visually fits with his style, um, whether he realizes it or not. Uh, our next comment on Instagram was from Mladen. Mladen? Mladen. Kuma- Mladen. Kuma- <laughs> Stop. Um, who said... As someone who read the graphic novel for the first time, I am happy to say that I prefer the movie over the source material. The movie focuses on the mystery without dragging unnecessary scenes or characters. Unlike the comic, where you have a guy reading the comic and showing the panels he's reading. This annoyed me to the point where I had to take a break multiple times before I finished reading the graphic novel. The scene where Rorschach says, I'm not trapped in here with you, you're trapped in here with me, worked better in the movie where you see him saying it versus the comic where you read from the psychologist's narration. Also, I preferred not knowing Rorschach's backstory in the movie, unlike the source material. You do get a little bit of his backstory in the, in the a, movie. A wee little bit, Not yeah. as much, um, at least in the theatrical cut. Maybe there's more in the ultimate cut or whatever. Um, but you do get some of it. Uh, but... Um, there was something else I was going to say. Uh, oh, the, we talked about the Black Freighter thing. I, I can understand it does kind of drag the pacing a little bit. Like mm-hmm. I said, I liked it. I enjoy it. But pacing wise, it's not, you know. Yeah. Based on what you described, I can see where that would get like irritating. It's a little. Yeah, it can be a little tedious. Um, Again, even even though I knew and appreciated what it was doing, I was like, yeah. all right. And I did enjoy the that story itself. It's just I'm more invested in the overall story. And I'm like, I, I think it, there was just a couple times where I was like, okay, if this part was like a couple pages shorter, <laughs> like a page or two shorter, that would be cool. But it's, it's not a big deal. Like I said, overall, I, I enjoyed it. But I, I could see how that it could be, that pacing could be kind of frustrating for some. Next up, we have Anal Fracture 42. First time I've gotten to say it. Very exciting. <laughs> I did watch the movie a few years ago for the first time and did really like it. Figured I should get the graphic novel and absolutely adore it ever since. Visually, I think the film is pretty much perfect and the story trimming is done really well. However, I think the comic uses its medium to tell the story in a way you can only that that you can only by the use of a comic, specifically the time aspect of Dr. Manhattan. They try their best in the movie and I couldn't do it any better, but it simply doesn't uh, make us understand Dr. Manhattan's time perception as the comic does. I mean, clearly I I had no idea what... Yeah, deal was yeah and we talked be. about that quite a bit. That we talked about that a lot in the main episode. Uh, I still like the film a lot, but ultimately, it is a really good adaptation of a perfect book. So yeah, the love the book, but also respect the film for getting me so interested that I picked up the comic. There you go. 
Our next comment was from Ashley. Uh, Ashley voted for the book, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, and said only better because the vibe is horny. <laughs> the vibe is horny. I want that on a t-shirt. I don't <laughs> know a, where I would wear it. It's a good. Because I good. think it would offend people. Yeah. I Yeah. But that would be a great like graphic tea slogan. It would, yeah. The vibe, the is, vibe horny. is horny. And it's just Ozymandias <laughs> in front of a in, in his chair in front of the wall of monitors with the with the Babastus laying next to him. And it's just like boobs on all the TVs or whatever. Yeah. Uh, next up, we have Jane Rendleman, who says, It's funny how even though the movie basically copies every scene from the book, I still have a tr strong preference for the book over the movie. I think Zack Snyder's heavily edited style and choice of pop songs misses the realism that the story is going for. Um, I don't know if I agree with the heavily edited part, because I, as, as a commenter earlier said, I think the montage and the editing in the film actually really captures kind of the style of the the frames and the way the 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 for lack of a better for, I'm sure there's a comic term for it but like the montage and the editing of the the way the elements are like uh -huh. the moments are presented in the graphic novel actually feels like it fits Zack Snyder's whole vibe pretty well um but I would agree with the with the score I think um I think there are element times where the pop music needle drops can work i think there are other times where maybe just a more traditional score would have worked better which there is a traditional score still at different times but um I, we talked about the music already so our last comment on instagram was from douglas michael campbell who said i really enjoyed your watchman episode I agree with Brian and that I like the graphic novel more than the film adaptation, but that doesn't take much away from what the film has done. Besides capturing a lot of the dark tones that made the story great, I do like the few touches Zack Snyder and everyone involved added to the film from most of the needle drop moments that capture the era it took place in. It does That's do that. such a nice way to describe yeah. the needle drop moments. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to the filmmaking choices made to accurately recreate panels from the graphic novel, the action set pieces, and controversially changed ending with Dr. Manhattan, which I like better personally than the original ending ending since it ties more into the established world of Watchmen. There are some goofier elements I'm not crazy about, like the Snyder slow-mo, the hallelujah song used after the fire rescue, and some moments with Rorschach and his Batman voice. In the end, the film is a nice companion piece to the graphic I novel. Think that's the biggest thing to me, and I, I kind of mentioned it, but I think it, it as a as a companion piece, it works really well. Mm -hmm. Like if you, I think it's very good if you have read the graphic novel and then watched the movie. I think that's the way to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think the movie by itself, not 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 the best thing in the world, just to kind of watch uh, on its own. I think it's still a little, you know, still works okay. But uh, combined by watching it after the the graphic novel, I think. I mean, I, I, I even better. think, too, you could do it the other way around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. if you, as and I, I don't know if we've ever talked, I'm sure we've talked about this on the show before, we've been doing this for years, but if you are someone who struggles with reading and, like, specifically struggles to, like, keep track of a story and, like, yeah, follow yeah. along with it, yeah. a fairly faithful adaptation like this could be really useful with you. You watch the movie you have the story and the characters already in your head. Yeah. So that's less work for your brain to do while you're reading. No, I think that actually is a really good point. I think that could be, can be a very effective way. Uh, if you have trouble reading stuff or yeah. getting into stuff to read, um, if you've seen a movie that you know, you like and you, you find the world interesting or the characters interesting using that as a jumping off point to go read it, I think makes a lot of sense. So yeah, I think either way would work um, because I do think, because I think if the other the interesting version of it is, yeah, if you watch the movie first, you're like, well, that was a like kind of an interesting, weird comic book movie. What are like, what's this is very different. I want to go see what like what's up with the comic book. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you go read the graphic novel and there's just so much more going on. Um, and the, and, and well, you get a lot more of uh, politically what, you know, Alan Moore is trying to say. Um, I definitely think that has its own merits. Yeah, think, which is really sure. interesting. And then finally, we have one comment from Goodreads. We had one vote for the book and zero for the movie from Miko. While I think the director's cut is better than the theatrical, that too pales in comparison to the book. The biggest problem for me is the tone. 
To more, these characters are broken people. To Snyder, broken superheroes. The same filmmaking tricks are used here to make things feel epic as later in Man of Steel or Zack Snyder's Justice League. Moore and Gibbons deliberately chose to admit sound effects to omit sound effects and motion lines, and Snyder did the opposite, emphasizing action with his constant slow motion and speed ramping. I feel like Snyder concentrated too much on recreating the panels and not the story. And despite the deconstruction, he still tries to make the heroes work as heroes. Every action scene has to be epic, like the killing of Hollis Mason or a comedian, but they don't go down like champs in the book. They get beaten in one-sided fights without us seeing them throw a single punch. Haven't seen the director's cut, so I'm assuming in Hollis Mason version, he like fights back. I agree, that's silly. The mm-hmm. whole point is he gets just brutally murdered, yeah. like unceremoniously in in the book. Uh, it's, he doesn't like go down fighting. He like they storm in and just smash his face in, and he's like, "What the hell?" Uh, so yeah, I, um, 100%. Uh, and and I, I guess I agree. Yeah, it kind of similarly with comedian, we get like an added fight scene. There is a little bit of a fight scene, and to be fair, he does fight back in the graphic novel. It's just not as long or protracted as it is in the movie. Or a fight that consists of a couple punches in the comic has protruding bones, neck sta- stabbing, neck snapping, gunshots, and two deaths in the movie. These characters aren't meant to be cool. Rorschach doesn't get winched up a side of a building. He has to manually climb the rope. In fact, more specified that the climb shouldn't look superhero-y. Night Owl doesn't jump and glide down from his ship. He uses a ladder. Snyder just can't help himself. Movie Rorschach jumps out of a window, lands, rolls, and knocks down seven officers before being overpowered. Comic Rorschach lands on a trash can, stumbles, and gets kicked in the face as he is immediately pinned to the ground. Also, while I get the reasoning behind removing the squid, I just cannot see how framing Dr. Manhattan would de-escalate tensions. Dr. Manhattan was on U.S. military payroll not two weeks prior. The whole U.S. nuclear defense system is built around him, and the Soviets amassed their huge nuclear arsenal because of him. The American Superman destroying Moscow would cause a retaliation no matter if New York was destroyed too. The squid also works because it's a classic silly Silver Age supervillain plot played straight to its bloody end. Ozymandias says he is not a villain from a Republic serial... from a public serial, but his plan involving a huge telepathic teleporting squid alien monster would fit right alongside some of these real releases like the purple monster strikes or zombies of the stratosphere. That's the joke. And the impact of the attack is gone. In the book, the aftermath hits you aftermath hits you with six full page six huge full page panels filled with hundreds of bloody corpses, some of which we recognize. In the movie, it's just a boring crater with no people in sight. In a different medium, the story loses so many storytelling devices that it truly becomes unfilmable. Not that I don't think Snyder didn't give it his best shot. The movie just feels lacking. I agree with most of that. It touched on the same thing that Shelby did. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I kind of disagree that about the Dr. Manhattan change. I still think that works. I, I think it works. I totally get what Miko is saying. I don't think it would be like an immediate no. solution to world peace no. but like but, in the world of the movie I, it's a gimme i'm willing to give yeah and especially because it be like it becomes clear that they set it up a little bit by having him be disgraced before this all happens mm-hmm. so like he left earth and like yes he was on u.s military payroll he was working for the u.s government but uh prior to the this big attack happening uh, the U.S. media and everybody in the U.S. kind of chastised him and chased him out of town. Right. And then he kills six million people in New York City. It seems reasonable to me that that you could buy that that um, the world powers like that the U.S. could spin this into being like or not spin it, but be like, hey, we 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 haven't, you know, like I, I think it's reasonable I get what you're saying, but I, I and again, it, I think the movie kind of glosses over it and makes it a little bit, but even that's true with the alien thing. They kind of just gloss over it and immediately yeah. everybody's like on board with being like, all right, we got to fight the aliens. Um, again, added to in the graphic novel by the fact they have the psychic wave bomb thing or whatever. But um, I do think that element mostly works in the book. That would be like really the only point I would disagree with there. Apart from that, uh, I co-sign a lot of a lot of what you had to say there, Miko. What was our final breakdown? Well, the winner was the book with 50 votes to the movie's 13. Yeah. uh, Plus three listeners who couldn't decide. There you go. All right. Thank you all very much for all that feedback. Ton of fun. Really appreciate it. Keep it up going forward. We love to hear from you. Love to talk about what you had to say, Katie. Now, though, we're going to talk about uh, the next thing we're doing. We're going to get the book facts for Lottie and Lisa. 
Why the sudden curiosity about your dad, huh? Mother, you can't avoid the subject forever. At least tell me what he was like. I want to talk to you about my mother. Well, what about your mother? Dad, I'm almost 12. How long do you expect me to buy that story that the stork dropped me on your doorstep? Everyone in the world believes they're unique in their own way. Annie James and Hallie Parker are about to discover. This is so freaky. They're both unique in the same way. That's my mom. That's my dad. And you and I are like, like sisters. Hallie, we're like twins. I have a brilliant idea. I think we should switch places. I'll go back to London as you, and you go back to California as me. If we switch, they'll have to unstitch us. And when they do, they'll have to meet again, face to face. Honey, you never looked better. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Lottie and Lisa is a 1949 German children's novel by Eric Kastner. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, now, I don't want to dive too deep into the author since we already have such a long episode yeah. here. Um, but uh, spoilers, he sounds kind of badass. Oh, yeah. Um, so he stayed in Germany through the rise of the Nazi party in World War II, uh, despite being interrogated by this Gestapo multiple times. Uh, Nazis burned his books for being, quote, contrary to the German spirit. Um, and they were like off and on about whether or not he was allowed to work. Uh, but he stayed there uh, partly because his mom was there and partly because he felt that he could better chronicle what was happening if he stayed and didn't like hmm. escape to another country like a lot of artists and writers were doing. Sounds, sounds very badass. Um, so this book initially started out as an idea for a movie in 1942, um, but then the Nazis were like, mm, no, we don't want you to work, uh, before it got off the ground. Um, and then after the war, he worked that idea into a, uh, according to Wikipedia, highly successful book. Uh, it was originally published under a title that I'm about to butcher, <laughs> uh, Das. Doppelt Lachen, Doppelt Lachen, I, I don't know. I, I, um, but it, which literally translates to the double Lotties. Okay. Uh, in 2014, the novel was retranslated into English and published as The Parent Trap um, rather than previous imprints English title, Lottie and Lisa. So we have an older book. Yeah, say so yours says yeah. Lottie and Lisa. Um, and in that 2014 edition, Lisa's name was also changed to Louise. Hmm. Uh, but this book has been adapted multiple times. Uh, aside from the 1998 film that we'll be discussing, it was adapted in Germany in 1950 and actually narrated by Kastner, the author. Uh, in 1961, by Disney as The Parent Trap, that's the one starring Haley Mills, mm -hmm. um, which after the 1998 is probably the one that most people yeah. are familiar with. Yeah. Um, in 1968, in India, in 1994, in Germany, again, under the title Charlie and Louise, and again in India in 2001. There you go. Not sure why it was also so popular in India, but there you go. Yeah. Fair enough. All right. Let's go now and learn a little bit more about the film that is based on that book, The Parent Trap. Welcome home, kiddo. Dad. Finally. Now, two sisters. Come back. Mother. Are setting the perfect trap. It seems like it's been forever. I have no idea. To bring their parents back together. This is an emergency. Dad's in love. What? Bring your shirt like this. I like it when I can see a little chest hair. It's disgusting. If there's any hope of getting mom and dad back together, we've got to do it fast. I am marrying your father in two weeks, and nothing you do is going to come between us. Ah! Hi, Mary. Hello. How you doing? Oh! Both of them? From the makers of Father of the Bride. Does everyone here know something I don't know? Yes. Dennis Quaid, Natasha Richardson, and introducing Lindsay Lohan. star I see tonight. Mom's amazing. Don't know how you ever let her go. I wish I may. I wish I might. Have my wish, wish come true tonight. Disney's The Parent Trap.
The Parent Trap is a 1998 film written and directed by Nancy Myers, known for What Women Want, Something's Gotta Give, The Holiday, It's Complicated, and The Intern, among others, but this was her directorial debut. Mm-mm. And it is co-written uh, by David Swift, who wrote, among other things, the 1961 version. Interesting. So this was actually his last, his final project before he died. Died oh. in like 2001. He was yeah. like 95 or something. But um, yeah, he wrote the original script for the Disney version. Hmm. And I thought maybe originally when I was reading it, when I saw that, that maybe he just got like a credit mm-hmm. because he, you know, they like borrowed elements. But it sounds like he actually, from what I was able to find, he actually worked on this script as well. Not hmm. just like, you know. Got a credit because he wrote the original script and they stole stuff from it. The film stars Lindsay Lohan, Dennis Quaid, uh, Natasha Richardson, Elaine Hendricks, Lisa Ann Walter, and a bunch of other people I'd never really heard of. Uh, Fun fact, and I didn't realize this, Lisa Ann Walter, uh, she plays the maid. Didn't know this at the time, obviously. She is a show we're watching right now, uh, Abbott Elementary. Mm Mm-hmm. She is, and I can't remember her character's name now, the redheaded teacher. Oh, shit, that is her. What is that teacher's name? I'm blanking. Uh, Miss Shamanti. Shamanti. Yeah. Miss Shamanti. Uh, yeah, that's her. She plays the maid in, or like housekeeper She's or something. She's the, the like housekeeper nanny. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's her. I was like, oh, that's fun. <laughs> Because I was like, I didn't think I'd seen her in anything before when we were watching her on Abbott Elementary. But anyways, uh, the film has an 86% on Rotten Tomatoes, a 64 on Metacritic, and a 6.6 out of 10 on IMDb. It made $92.1 million against a budget of $15 million. Getting into some fun stuff, some fun facts. More than 1,500 actresses auditioned for the role of Haley and Annie, but Nancy Myers was looking for, quote, a little Diane Keaton, end quote. Hmm. Uh, other people aside from Lindsay Lohan uh, who supposedly faked an illness to get out of school and go to the audition for the role other actors that were considered included uh, and this is not an extensive list but some of the big names Scarlett Johansson Mara Wilson Michelle Trachtenberg and Jenna Malone Uh, Mara Wilson was deemed to be too young Hmm. because this is like right after uh, or right before this is like Matilda it's not uh, Matilda was like 96 I think like right after Matilda yeah. yeah Uh, so they thought Mara Wilson was too young. And then Jenna Malone apparently was offered the role three times and turned it down every time. Huh. All right. Getting into IMDb trivia, because there was not a lot of production notes on uh, Wikipedia about this that I could find. So for split screen scenes, and we're going to talk more about this later. I have a note at the end uh, about some of this stuff. Um, but for split screen scenes, uh, Lindsay Lohan wore an earpiece, which would play back her pre-recorded dialogue as the other sister so that she would have the timing and mm-hmm. something to act again. So she could hear herself giving the other lines and then she would give the lines that she needed while she was like in the scene. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Actress Joanna Barnes, who plays the wicked girlfriend in the parent trap 1961 uh, and plays the mother of the wicked girlfriend in this version. In the 1998 version, the wicked girlfriend's name is Meredith rather than Vicky and Joanna Barnes's character as the mother in the new parent trap version is still named Vicky. Hmm. So she may even be the same character. Probably not, but. <laughs> but. You never know. We could headcanon you that could. it's the yeah. same character. Uh, this is one of the only f- Disney films that shows a, a character, and specifically they said it, very uncharacteristically, a mother uh, intentionally getting drunk and smoking a cigarette. It's an iconic scene. So there you go. Uh, the scene where Annie and Hallie are laying, Haley, Hallie? I think it's I think it's Hallie. Okay. Are lying in bed. Uh, there's a scene where the camera pans from the moon to their parent pic- parents' pictures and then to the twins in bed. Apparently took six hours to get it done right. That feels and it, within that, it, apparently, uh, Lindsay Lohan had to like sneak back and forth, like had to like oh, switch back yeah. and forth between the. I don't know the shot. So. Huh. Um, but apparently it took six hours to get that shot right. Uh, in the movie, Dennis Quaid is engaged to a 26-year-old gold digger. Coincidentally, his fourth wife, he married her when she was 26. Quaid was 65 at the time. Uh, and as a result, his co-star Elena Hendricks, or Elaine Hendricks tweeted at him, better watch out for those twins. Uh, Got him. <laughs> uh, this is a really random fact. Both the original... And uh, the 1961 version and the 1998 version are exactly two hours and nine minutes long. Twins. Yeah. 
so during the booby trap cabin scene, uh, there's a they drop a water balloon on Annie's head. They had to fasten a thumbtack onto into Lindsay Lohan's hair so that the balloon would pop before it actually hit her. The balloon was so big uh, and so heavy that if they had just dropped it on her head without the tack there, uh, it very likely would not have popped and may have caused serious neck injuries because, mm. you know, it weighed quite a bit. Um, so, yeah. Uh, there's a scene apparently where Lindsay Lohan steps in barefoot in molasses. And this was shot 10 times because it wouldn't squish between her toes properly. Uh, and this is me reading this trivia fact suspiciously. <laughs> <sighs> For everybody involved, the person who wrote the fun fact, the person who knew that the person who decided they needed to film it 10 times because it didn't squish properly between her toes, all of it. I'm looking at all of it suspiciously. Don't like it. Uh, apparently, it's a poker game. So I have seen this movie, but I don't remember anything about it. I haven't it. seen I, this movie for years. I saw it when it came out, and I was like, that was fun when yeah. I was 10 or whatever. I do not think I've seen it since then. Uh, during the poker game, uh, Annie gets a straight flush, the odds of which are 72,000 to 1. And in that same hand, Hallie gets a royal flush, the odds of which are 650,000 to 1. The odds of both of those hands happening in the same round is 46.8 billion to 1. This is more poker hands than have been played at all of the major casinos on the Las Vegas Strip over the past 100 years. Uh, and in comparison, the odds of winning the lottery is 14 million to one. Okay, but like, what are the odds of meeting your long lost twin at summer camp? I mean, way better than that. You think? I think way better than that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so other people that were considered for the role of Nick Parker, the father. Uh, this is fun. David Hasselhoff, Richard Gere, Jeff Bridges, Kurt Russell, Patrick Swayze, Pierce Brosnan, Bill Murray, Jeff Daniels, Harrison Ford, Tom Hanks, Tim Allen, Kevin Costner, John Travolta, Mel Gibson, Bruce Willis, Bill Paxton, Michael Keaton, Jim Carrey, Adam Sandler, and Robert Williams. That's just a list of every white man in Hollywood in 1998. You're not wrong there. You're not wrong there. I just, I was like, that's everybody. What are we doing here? What do you mean considered? I feel like that was like their starting list. Yeah. And not actually like not the considered. people yeah. they They're like, okay, who or could we get? Or well, these are all people who are actors in Hollywood. It's like, okay. And then finally getting into some uh, reviews of the film. A critic Kenneth Turin called Lo, uh, Lohan, quote, the soul of this film as much as Haley Mills was the soul of the original and went on to say, quote, she is more adept than her predecessor at creating two distinct personalities. And uh, Lindsay Lohan actually won a Young Artist Award for Best Performance in, uh, uh, in this movie. I know I am not unique in this. I was convinced for a very there long time that she was tw that she had a twin. Yeah, I, yeah, no, totally understandable. Uh, and then finally, getting the Roger Ebert's uh, review of this, which I had to go find. It wasn't included on Wikipedia. I went to the, his website and found the actual review and pulled snippets wow, out you of did, it. You did. He did the legwork uh, for yeah, us. Yeah, well, because I knew he was alive, so I was like, "Well, why is it not on here?" Because yeah. almost every time they will have Ebert's. It did have that. It did say that hit Siskel and Ebert or Ebert and Roper, whoever it was at the time, gave it three out of four stars. But they didn't have. Normally, they have snippets from yeah. Ebert's review, and they didn't. I was like, "I gotta go find it." And so I was able to find it on the website, and I kind of took some own, my, some of my own snippets. Uh, that I, I wanted to include here. So quoting from his review, the twins are played by the same actress using trick photography. Haley Mills did it in 1961 and Lindsay Lohan does it this time seamlessly. Although I was aware of the special effects and the over the shoulder doubles were being used. I simply stopped thinking about it because the illusion was so convincing. Uh, he then went on to say that the, the switch is just a setup and the real story involves the parents. They're played by Dennis Quaid and Natasha Richardson, who bring such humor and warmth to the movie that I was amazed to find myself actually caring about their romance. And then uh, going on, quote, movies like this remember how much fun escapism can be. Lindsay Lohan has command of flawless British and American accents and also uses slightly flawed ones for when the other girls are playing each other. What she has all the time is the same kind of sunny charm that Haley Mills projected and a sense of mischief that makes us halfway believe in the twin scheme and his only uh, and, and then finally uh, Ebert's only reservation was quote it involves an ear piercing scene which I suspect will lead to an epidemic of do it yourself home surgery uh, so apparently his concern for children's ear safety led the film getting docked an entire star because other than that, his review oh, was entirely positive, dramatic, entirely positive review other than 
there's this an ear piercing scene where kids might hurt themselves three out of four stars <laughs> like, all right. um and so i didn't talk too much in this whole thing about uh how they did the twin thing we had talked about if we had yeah. time we were going to do maybe that as a learning thing segment but i think what uh, might actually be fun is that anytime in the movie you mm-hmm. wonder how are they doing the twin thing in this scene mention it to me okay i'll make a note of that and i'll probably like, be able like to figure it, it to you while like we're while we're watching because okay. that otherwise i won't be able i would okay. have to go back mention it while we're watching i can probably figure out how they're doing it the answer is usually probably just like filming the scene twice but depending on mm-hmm. what it is and we'll, we'll we'll kind of talk about it as we go. So yeah. if there's a handful of scenes where you're like, how are okay. they doing it? Yeah, I mean, I know how they did some stuff. Yeah. But like other things, I'm like, hey, how'd they do that? Yeah. So yeah, just anytime there's one of those, mention it to me and I'll make a note and I'll, because I can probably figure out how they yeah. were doing it while we're watching. So You're so useful. I love you. <laughs> Uh, as always, you can do us a giant favor by heading over to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Goodreads, like y'all did, but you know, you you guys, the people here now, they know, because they did it, so they could message us all this stuff. Uh, you can also support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash thisfilmislit. We really appreciate it. Uh, and if you support us at the $15 and up level on Patreon, you get access to bonus, or sorry, to uh, priority recommendations. And this one is a priority re- recommendation from... This is a recommendation from Matilde. Awesome. Thank you very much, Matilde. Katie, where can people watch The Parent Trap? Well, as always, you can check with your local library, or if you have a still uh, a, a local video rental store, <laughs> yeah. you can check with them. Yeah. Uh, if not, you can stream this with a subscription to Disney Plus, or you can rent it for around three to four bucks from AMC Theaters on Demand, Apple TV, Amazon, YouTube, Vudu, Redbox, or DirecTV. There you go. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to revisiting this one. Yeah, uh, Like I said, too. I remember enjoying it as a kid, being like, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. like a fun movie that I liked. I, I'm sure I had a crush on Lindsay Lohan at the time. Who didn't? Who um, indeed? <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, I am looking forward to revisiting this one. And it's got very good reviews, actually. Like, mm-hmm. it, it, it's supposedly a very good, um, very fun, you know, very well-made little family comedy. So, yeah, should be good. Come back in one week's time. We're talking about The Parent Trap. Until that time, guys, gals, I'm Binary Pals, everybody else. Keep reading books. Watching movies. And and keep keep being awesome. awesome.